So IDX uh, is a cross protocol identity standard. Um, tying into the previous talks by uh, Daniel and Joel, IDX, which we'll dive into, is really a way to manage the entire universe of user information or, or just generally information about a DID uh, in a decentralized way. Um, and it's built on top of ceramic. So it has all the properties um, that Joel just described and uses ceramic tiles and other um, stream processing data types to basically create the system. And all right, uh, so for fear of repetition here, um, I won't go into detail about all of these things, but sort of building on what Daniel said, um, identity is really the aggregation of information about a subject. So the entire universe of all the things you say, do, um, your presence online. And in Web2, obviously we have app-specific identifiers that require you know, server-side authentication. Um, and in a traditional you know, relational database model, if you're using DynamoDB or something, um, you'll probably you know, build a user table, um, except these are all just fragmented and app siloed. So they can really only map to other data resources produced by the user as they interact with that single application. Um, and they're not designed for interoperability. So they're, you know, they're tied to the one tech stack implementation that that application chooses, and they actively discourage discoverability of this information by outsiders. They keep it safeguarded because that's their business. Um, but in Web3, it sort of aims to flip that model um, from app siloed to user siloed. And the pieces of that are open identifiers. So DIDs, um, like Daniel and Joel talked about with sort of, you know, client-side authentication, it could be server-side, but sort of client-side as the starting point um, for decentralization. And uh, ideally, you have this unified DID-centric index of information and resources associated to that user or that identity. Um, ideally, this index you know, maps to resources anywhere because you know, there are different data producers and consumers. So as a user interacts with App A, App A might be storing data uh, directly in Filecoin, or App B might be storing data in Textile, App C might be storing data on a centralized data store somewhere. Um, and the aim is to make all of that data um, interoperable and discoverable uh, in a single place, a unified location, independent from any technology that any single application implements. And I won't have to go through this, so thanks, Daniel, but the building block is DIDs. Really critical to sort of understand that these are decentralized identifiers registered in some decentralized, you know, ledger or data platform where this data is independent of any third party. Um, and these identifiers and their resulting documents that they represent um, are truly decentralized because everything sort of builds from that. And so if we think about, you know, the design goals of really what one wants to achieve when designing a decentralized identity standard, um, we can see them on the list here. Um, and so the first one is really just flexibility, um, sort of making the standard agnostic to any particular technology stack that a given application developer might choose to deploy on. Um, so it's ideal that this standard works with any DID method, you know, whether it's ION, um, you know, being run by Microsoft or Element, the other implementation of SideTree, or 3ID DID and some other DIDs native to Ceramic, like it shouldn't matter um, because these DIDs will come from all over the place. Um, it should work with all authentication methods and key pairs. So, you know, being able to control one identity from N number of sign-in methods, whether that's a blockchain key pair in a client-side wallet or a social login managed by a service on a server, um, those should all be able to control the root identifier, which from that you generate you know, the signatures and the encryption, which enables attribution of content and, and control of information. And it should work with all data storage technologies, formats, and locations. So whatever you wanna build on, whatever wherever you wanna deploy, it shouldn't matter. Uh, discoverability. So this is really the key piece um, to building sort of this, this data index where instead of the app siloed model where we have today, um, you know, moving towards a user siloed or user centric model, 
it's important that we begin to describe data semantically versus describing it like, oh, it's data from app A or data from app B, because app C might not like care or know that, you know, app A and B are both blogging platforms. And so I need to know which other apps a user has used when I'm querying this information. It should be described by the data itself, like by the shape of the data, the schema, some metadata and description so that it's more interoperable. It's not tied. You don't need to know all of the other apps that are also using the standard in order to consume data that wasn't created by your application. And this should all be organized in one logically centralized location. And it's logically centralized because uh, it exists in one place, but it's on a decentralized network. So it's you know sort of physically decentralized, but logically centralized. Um, and it should be privacy preserving. So this system should be able to support public and private information, as Daniel mentioned. Um, and really the, the concept of pseudonymity and progressive identity needs to be prevalent when designing it. You can't build an identity standard that has a, has a requirement for like a meat space ID or like a government issued legal identity to use and onboard, but rather all identities sort of start pseudonymous and empty. And depending on what sort of information the user adds to them as they interact with apps, this identity begins to gain, begins to gain meaning over time as it's used. And it's up to the user to decide what sort of information they want to add to this identity. Um, some of them could end up taking on the shape of legal identities. Maybe that same user has a different identity that they begin to form into a different sort of like persona. Um, you know, we're not limiting one user to one IDX, um, but rather sort of keeping it open so it can be used in as many ways as desirable. And it's important that these have standard interfaces. So, um, you know, common, a common way to read and write information from this index um, makes things interoperable. You don't have to integrate one-off APIs for every single data source um, because that would be too cumbersome to actually achieve our goals of interoperability. And, you know, trustless and scalable. So deployed on decentralized permissionless infrastructure in the same way that Daniel said DIDs themselves should be. Uh, well, also this index IDX data structure should be um, sort of as the first principle, um, because then it's truly controlled by the users and not by a third party or a server that if it goes down, all of your data and routing information is now gone, um, even if it's for a period of minutes. And scalability. So the infrastructure, the decentralized infrastructure it's built on needs to be able to scale to be able to support it, um, which is sort of why we deployed IDX on ceramic. And a quick intro to how it actually works. So it's a decentralized data structure using ceramic um, streams for associating any kind of data to a DID. So here you see DID1 happens to be a three ID, um, which is a DID method native to ceramic. It uses a tile, as Joel said. And here on the bottom, you see DID2. It's an ION DID, so it's you know anchored in Bitcoin on the ION protocol and network. Um, and they both have a corresponding index. And even though the DID documents that Daniel talked about, he showed they have public keys used for signature, verification, and encryption, and also additionally service endpoints. The nice thing about Ceramic and IDX is you don't actually have to register the index in the DID document as a service. You could for redundancy, um, but Ceramic has this deterministic property where if you know the DID and you know you're looking for its index, you can deterministically query for this index and the Ceramic protocol will resolve and return the index for the user without needing to actually establish a link, which is critical because there's so many different DID methods having like a common way to plug them in might not always be feasible. So given a DID, you can always deterministically generate what its index is and return the current state. And here you see two users. And so next, the developer will create a schema, publish that to Ceramic in a tile, and we'll take that Ceramic stream ID and plug it into a definition and then deploy that definition on Ceramic as a tile. And the definition basically is the semantic description of a resource. And so here you see some metadata. Let's assume that it's a basic profile uh, it has some description, a universal profile, and it has a schema. And so this serves, the, the stream ID of this definition serves as a key in the index. And as a developer, I only need to create a definition once and I can use it for n number of users. So in user one on the top and user two on the bottom, that same stream ID will 
both of their indexes. And now as a user, user one comes to my app, they plug in some profile information. Um, it happens to be Satoshi, they have an IPFS uh, image and they have a description. And at that point, using the IDX API, when you create this record, it the IDX library automatically publishes the definition stream ID and the record stream ID, which is a separate stream into your index. So now you have this map from stream ID of definition to stream ID of record. Um, so you have information stored semantically organized. And now when user two comes, the same definition stream ID is, is a key in their index and they create a separate record, which is its own stream, which contains their profile. Um, so now you have you know, thousands of users of your app. They all build on one common data definition and each of the corresponding data records are stored separately in streams. And in these records, I think it's important to call out, um, they can either directly contain data, like the example I just showed of a basic profile, you know, you can just dump that JSON data in a record um, and it's sort of self-contained, or you can use records as sort of jump off points or routing mechanisms to external storage. So the record in that case would just contain, you know, a URI and potentially some other metadata which when resolved would enable you to route to some external to IDX source of information. And that could be other ceramic documents, like imagine you have an IDX record that says blog posts. And so in it, you just have an array of ceramic doc IDs and each of those ceramic or stream IDs and each of those streams is an independent blog post. Um, so those would sort of be considered external storage and you're using IDX as sort of an aggregation mechanism for all of those. Uh, pointers. You can do the same thing imagining it with Filecoin files or files stored on any other sort of decentralized durable storage network. Um, you could point to textile data stores or orbit data stores, other centralized versions or even on-chain contracts. Um, and so sort of serving as this technology independent way, you can use records as sort of data stores or pointers to additional data stores, which sort of all serve to organize information. And um, IDX is more than just about users, as Daniel and Joel both said. Um, if it can be represented by a DID, it can have an IDX. So, you know, for the case of people, it's pretty self-explanatory. Organizations uh, with the, the DID specifications that Joel was talking about, or however they choose to represent themselves. Um, content, the NFT uh, DID method allows NFTs, which are digital content, to now have an identity and have their org all their information organized in an IDX, which allows them to build up this entire meta content universe that's portable and moves around with that NFT and even devices. Uh, and adoption. So um, Ceramic's still in testnet, but more than 100 projects are signed up for ELP, the early launch program on Ceramic. Um, there's a bunch of big names here um, and we're looking forward to a pretty successful launch. Um, and I think I noticed that I left one slide out really quickly, but I can talk through it. And that's, um, you know, some common use cases for records where that we're seeing already. And that's um, using a record as actually an authentication keychain for a DID. So you can take the DID seed, you can encrypt it with some blockchain account, let's say, and store it in a record. And you're storing an array of effectively encrypted seed material. Um, and so as a user, you know, uses their MetaMask to sign into an app, that app can then decrypt the DID seed in an iframe that's secure and protected. Um, we are building one called 3ID Connect, which allows users to sort of authenticate their DID from all of their blockchain wallets. Um, people are using it for profiles and social graphs, um, user generated content like blog posts and photos, um, and user settings. So, you know, maybe a user says, I want to persist all my files to this specific PowerGate instance that's running Filecoin. Um, and so instead of the app itself, you know, running a, a PowerGate instance for all of its users' data, users can specify their own. So they're sort of bringing their files and their persistence with them from platform to platform so that they can have one universal billing where, you know, maybe they're being billed and they subscribe to this specific backup provider that is now portable across all these interfaces. Um, alternative approaches to IDX, I figured it'd be worthwhile mentioning them to so you can see the difference. Um, 
you could like, you know, people say, why don't you store everything in the DID document? Um, that's really hard. One, because sort of agreeing on all of the standards for all of the data formats and how to interpret the data in a DID document seems extremely difficult. Um, and so those standards are going to be impossible to achieve for the entire data that is represented by the digital world. And so having some way to describe definitions and semantically organizing it um, outside the bounds of the DID document is important. Additionally, DID documents need to be kept super lightweight because they're probably one of the most synced things. Like every time you go to an app, they need to sync your DID document. And so if that document just keeps growing, the sync time uh, increases and it bloats that document away from the critical information, which is really just the signature um, keys, like your public keys for signatures and encryption. Um, some say you use a smart contract DID. Well, that sort of ties your, your DID and your index and wraps it into one thing um, and is sort of tied to a specific blockchain network where it makes it really hard to do cross-chain interoperability and all of the sort of flexibility around um, data descriptions. And alternatively, uh, I think what Daniel said is, you know, there is a service endpoint in the DID document which can point to a secure data store or personal data store where a lot of your information is managed uh, on a server instance running somewhere um, and all apps write and read to write to and read from that single instance managed by theoretically you, but in all practice by a cloud provider. Um, and that just doesn't seem like a valid approach to decentralization. Um, because if, if sort of that, if that server is the first jumping off point to find all your data, um, there's a big responsibility on that single server, even if it's replicated. So relying on decentralized infrastructure to be that first jump point. And then if you choose to route to a secure data store from IDX to store a subset of your information that you want to keep super encrypted and private on a server seems like a better approach. So it should be like DIDs, IDX, then whatever hosted data stores you would want rather than going directly from DID to hosted data store. Um, and yeah, you can get started with this stuff today. So Ceramic has a JavaScript full node, which can run in browser or client side or a, an HTTP API. Um, and for authentication, you can authenticate your DID with all kinds of blockchain wallets that your users already have using 3ID Connect, or you can natively integrate a DID provider if you're trying to do something more complex. Um, and IDX is a JavaScript SDK. So you can drop it right into your app client side and it works. Um, and yeah, you can check out the docs, developers.idx.xyz. Our blog um, at Ceramic Network uh, has a lot of good content and tutorials if you're looking to play around. Um, and if you're interested in, in trying these things out, Ceramic is on testnet, so you can just go ahead and start building. Um, but if you want to move your app to production um, on these systems, I would encourage you to sign up for the early launch program um, that will sort of, that we're accepting applications for now and we'll officially go live in a little more than a month. So that's all for me.